David Redwine can review take one. Red wine. Uh, I'm a gynecologist specializing uh, primarily in treatment of endometriosis in Bend, Oregon. Okay. Um, can you tell us then how you became interested? In well, I became interested in endometriosis uh, primarily because my wife had it, and I experienced, you know, all the helplessness that a spouse can feel when dealing with a disease that y you can't help your spouse deal with directly and uh, I saw the frustration that she went through and that I went through in dealing with the various forms of treatment that uh, were available including Danazol therapy, birth control pill therapy and um, it, it, as I was uh, exposed to the disease through my wife's eyes that it, it uh, was a disease that was totally different than the disease I had been trained about in medical school, internship, and residency. So I realized that there was more to the story than what we had learned, and uh, uh, I began to study it some years ago. I usually treat about uh, between 10 and 25 patients with endometriosis each month. Uh, treat on the average of about between 100 and 200 patients annually with the disease. The most difficult, th there's several difficult things. The most difficult thing actually is the, uh, the inertia of organized medicine in terms of uh, accepting new thoughts on the disease. Uh, there's widespread confusion about the disease that everyone agrees exists. Doctors agree it exists. Researchers agree that it exists. Patients certainly know that the confusion exists, and the the thing that sh that should ring in everybody's mind is that uh, some of the concepts and conventional wisdom that guide us must be wrong, because that's only that's the only way that the confusion can be allowed to exist is for mistakes to be repeated over the years, and um, it seems clear that there's a lot of inertia that allow that that inhibits people from opening their mind up to, to see new ways of, of progress. That's the most difficult thing about the disease because it affects me and it affects all my patients and it affects uh, every physician caring for the disease too. Okay, is it possible to estimate the number of women who suffer with endo? Without, without stopping women on the street and doing a laparoscopy on them, there's no way to estimate the actual incidence of the disease or the prevalence of the disease in the population. The best estimates range anywhere from 5% of the population to 20% of the population. Uh, I usually tell my patients it's about 10 to 15% of all women are affected by the disease. Do you specialize in endo treatment and diagnosis? There is no such thing as a subspecialty in endometriosis, although sometimes I think it's worthy of such subspecialty status. Uh, functionally, I now take care of endometriosis patients almost exclusively. I do have a small general gynecology practice. I know of several other physicians in the country who deal almost exclusively with endometriosis patients. But none of us, none of us is uh, really a, a specialist in endometriosis because there is no such thing. Endometriosis, what is it? Endometriosis is the most common gynecological disease there is by far. It's a disease where tissue that uh, somewhat remotely resembles the lining of the uterus, the tissue of the lining of the uterus, is found outside the uterus uh, in various areas. Uh, this tissue uh, is only a poor mimic or poor representation of the tissue that lines the interior of the uterus though because it doesn't look like the lining of the uterus when you look at it with your eye. When you look at it under the microscope it frequently has a different appearance under the microscope than the lining of the uterus. So it, it basically remotely resembles tissue of the lining of the uterus. Endometriosis is more common than any other gynecological malady you've ever heard of. It's far more common than pelvic inflammatory disease, PID. It's far more common than fibroids. It's far more common than herpes. Uh, 
anything else that you have ever heard emphasized on radio, TV, or by your doctor uh, as being common, endometriosis is far more common. What colors does it exist in? Endometriosis uh, has a protean uh, visual manifestation. It can range any, anywhere from uh, colorless little uh, papules. Uh, there, these can have some adjacent reddish hemorrhage. There can be some whitish or yellowish scarring associated with it. Uh, as women get older, you can start to pick up darker hemorrhagic areas. And uh, in, in, in some patients, you can have what's called a black powder burn lesion, although that's not a very common manifestation of the disease. What are the symptoms? The cardinal symptom of, en of endometriosis is pain. Uh, women experience a variety of pains. They, a very common kind of pain that they describe as pain away from the menstrual flow. They frequently describe it as a sharp, stabbing, shooting kind of pain uh, or knife-like. They frequently uh, twist their fist either towards themselves or towards the examiner as they describe the pain to emphasize the sharp quality of the pain. Uh, menstrual cramps, although they can be associated with endometriosis, uterine cramps with the menstrual flow are not always due to endometriosis. Uh, endometriosis also frequently can cause painful sexual intercourse, painful bowel movements, uh, pain riding in a rough car, uh, pain with jarring forms of exercise, uh, pain just sitting around doing nothing, almost any uh, kind of pain between uh, the rib cage and the thighs can be mimicked by endometriosis. It's frequently misdiagnosed as PID, ovulation pain, ectopic pregnancy, appendicitis, adhesions, uh, a variety of things that are actually relatively rare. Is it a progressive, static, or recurring disease in the uh, Endometriosis has long been thought to be a uh, spreading progressive disease in a woman's pelvis and in part that's because many people believe that Samson's theory of reflux menstruation out the fallopian tubes is the way endometriosis occurs and it's it's natural to assume if that theory is operative that as women get older they would have more and more areas of the pelvis involved by the disease actually nobody's ever looked into that until uh, a study done in 1987 uh, where a simple pelvic mapping study uh, sought to try to answer the question, do women have more pelvic areas involved by endometriosis as you examine older age groups of patients? And the results of the study found that older age groups don't have more areas of the pelvis involved. So in that sense, the concept of dandelion spread of endometriosis does not seem to, to hold water. And nobody has ever demonstrated that, although everybody believes that. Now, in terms of local invasion and recruitment of scar tissue around individual lesions, yes, that does occur, but that's uh, fundamentally different from saying that it spreads from point A to point B to point C. So it can be locally invasive, locally progressive, but uh, so far there's no evidence whatsoever that it spreads throughout the pelvis like dandelion seeding a field. So positionally, it seems to be a static disease. Uh, <clears throat> I've read in material that endo bleeds and, and in your video you uh, go forward the opposite theory. Can you explain? Many gynecologists have the mistaken assumption that endometriosis bleeds. Uh, if you go to a basic biology textbook and look up the biology of menstruation, um, you find that the glands and stroma of the endometrium secrete. They secrete a mucinous type of a product. Uh, glands secrete, blood vessels bleed. When you look at endometriosis under the microscope, <clears throat> the microscopic picture of endometriosis consists of glands and stroma. And just as in the lining of the uterus, since the glands secrete and, and blood vessels bleed, the glands and stroma of endometriosis, the glandular elements secrete something, but uh, that's not to say that it bleeds. Uh, there are capillaries adjacent to the glands and stroma that may become destabilized by whatever it is that the endometriosis is secreting, and those capillaries over there may do the bleeding, but the endometriosis itself, uh, I believe it's incorrect to say that it bleeds, and in fact, uh, there have been recent studies uh, finding that uh, whenever you, at whatever time of the menstrual cycle you care to look at endometriosis lesions, uh, many of them don't have any hemorrhage around them at all. How do you identify? The, the identification process starts in the doctor's office in talking with the patient and examining the patient. Uh, since the most 
common and important symptom of the disease is pain, uh, the doctor has to be suspicious that any patient who walks through his door complaining of pain has endometriosis. Uh, the doctor would do well to just guess that the patient has endometriosis and start with that as a starting point rather than trying to diagnose rare things like pelvic infections, uh, ovarian cysts, ruptured ovarian cysts, and things like that. And there are many other factors that impact on fertility. So if the doctor in his office were to use infertility as his primary screen for who he's going to take to surgery to diagnose endometriosis, he's going to be shutting out uh, a lot of patients with the disease before they even get uh, out of his door. So the interview in the office is important. You have to listen to the patient. And even if you consider PID, as a possible cause of their pain. A study uh, from Scandinavia several years ago showed that almost almost 50 percent of the clinical diagnoses of PID in the doctor's office were, were wrong. It turned out to be something else at laparoscopy. Uh, once you have selected you know, the patients that you're going to be taking the surgery and, and paying you money to lie to you, uh, these people have, have, have usually put up with tremendous problems for many months or years. Uh, so by the time you get them to surgery, um, you have to be then aware of what endometriosis looks like at surgery. Uh, the textbooks are filled with descriptions of endometriosis as the black powder burn lesion, and there are many uh, illustration hemorrhagic manifestations. He's going to misdiagnose up to two-thirds of his patients, and he's going to completely miss the diagnosis in up to 40 percent of his patients. And uh, so if you're not aware of what endometriosis looks like, you're going to underdiagnose the, the disease in a lot of patients, and that's going to lead to uh, undertreatment and mistreatment. It is endo a disease that has racial balance. Endometriosis has been described in all races. I have no reason to suspect that it uh, has any particular racial tendency. You have to be suspicious that any woman, no matter what her color, who comes in complaining of pain has endometriosis. That in her textbooks though still because I was reading Jim Wolder's book that mm. it had been uh, thought that, that Orientals and the blacks were excluded. No, no. There's there's more more modern studies that have shown, for instance, that blacks have a, their their own fair share of endometriosis. Under what symptomatic circumstance would you recommend that a woman undergo a laparoscopy to confirm that? I recommend laparoscopy uh, for the patient who answers, I, I ask the patient the question. I say, do you have pain or some other problem that you don't want to live with? If you don't want to live with it physically or mentally, uh, you have to approach it and you have to find out what it is. If the woman says, I have a problem I don't want to live with, she needs a laparoscopy. What's the youngest age that you would perform a laparoscopy on? Um, I, I would perform a laparoscopy on anybody with uh, sufficient symptoms and uh, uh, to justify the, the procedure. If a woman is... 13, say? Oh, yes. The, I, the, the 